So because we went out of order last time and did chapters three and six uh, together, we're going to jump back to chapter four, go back from Darius the Mede or Persian back to Nebuchadnezzar uh, and find yet another story of a king and dreams and interpretation, uh, but of a slightly different one. Uh, in this case, the king has a dream and, and presents it to his, uh, to his uh, courtiers, to his wise men, and, and, and they fail to interpret it. And of course, along comes uh, Daniel and does so. Uh, so again, we have set up this contest between Daniel the wise man and uh, the Mesopotamian wise men. Just part of the ongoing uh, dispute between Judeans and, and natives. Is yes. that the issue here? Who, who has the better way of interpreting mysteries? Mm -hmm. The Babylonians had this famous apparatus of divination and all these experts. Right. And uh, Daniel comes along and poo-poos all that <laughs> and just prays to his God and gets the revelation. But you would have to say that Nebuchadnezzar learned something since chapter 2. Yeah. At least this time he told him what the dream was. That's right. Um, and the, what happens then is actually somewhat remarkable. I don't think there's anything quite like it in, in the rest of the Bible. That is, the interpretation of the dream is, Daniel says, you're going to go crazy for a year. Yeah. Now, the dream itself is about a big tree yeah. that's cut down. Yeah. And then we're told a watcher and holy one mm -hmm. comes down from heaven. We'll meet lots of holy ones in the second half of the book. And they, they announce a, pronounce a judgment. And the judgment is on the king. Uh, when Daniel interprets it, he's kind of apologetic about this. And he <laughs> says, I, I hope this is for your enemies, not for you. Yeah. Uh, but in fact, it is for him. And that he is, in effect, to go mad for seven years. He's going to be out there like a wild animal, yeah. uh, drinking the dew of the field. <laughs> um, what, since we don't think that this actually happened again, uh, what do we make of this as a, you know, if, if it's not historical that the king went mad, what kind of message is this? Why, why, would, why would this be the, the story? Well, you know, this is the, the case where we have the best chance of tracing how a story developed. Mm. And for a long time, scholars had recognized that this was probably originally a story about a different king. And this was Nabonidus, the last king of Babylon. When Nabonidus was king, he had got, gone away from Babylon for 10 years, out into the Arabian wilderness to Tema, and he was obsessed with worshipping the moon god. Mm -hmm. Now, the priests in Babylon had nothing but contempt for him. And they wrote then, you know, also when the Persians took over, they say actually Marduk is punishing Babylon for the neglect uh, by Nebuchadnezzar. But I think the idea of a king who went mad probably goes back to that story about uh, Nabonidus. Yeah. Now, we got some confirmation of that in the Dead Sea Scrolls mm -hmm. because one of the texts found there is called the Prayer of Nabonidus. And Nab, the king is called Nabonidus, mm -hmm. and he has he is afflicted with a severe disease. He doesn't go mad, actually, in that one. Uh, but he's afflicted with this disease until a Jewish diviner comes along and tells him, you should be praying to our God. Mm -hmm. And when he does that, yeah. he heals up. Now, that's probably an intermediate stage of the story, mm -hmm. and... This, you know, could, the beginnings of this story could go back to close to the time of Nabonidus. Yeah. Uh, to the, that is to say, back in the, the sixth century. Yeah. Uh, but then, by the time it gets to the book of Daniel, they figure actually it's much more fun to tell the story about Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. Especially since Nebuchadnezzar uh, has already been invoked in, in these yeah, stories. Yeah. And I mean, there's definitely some humor in it. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's thinking of your great adversary out there like a wild animal, mm -hmm. like a beast of the field. Yeah. But yes. part of the prediction is it's passing, right? Yes. It's a temporary yes. stage. And so, you know, there's, there's no real punishment here. It's embarrassment, 
really, is, is, is the punishment. It's, it's sort of your reputation is harmed, but in the end you'll be right back where you began, but presumably having learned something. Presumably. I mean, seven years in the wilderness, especially if you're crawling around like a wild beast, mm -hmm. uh, might qualify as punishment <laughs> for a while. But yeah. it is, it's not final. Right. You know, there is always a way back. Mm -hmm. for the Babylonian kings in the first half of the book of Daniel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, when he comes to his senses, what what's he think? going to say? Yeah. It's the God of Daniel is the true God. I was a real fool not to be worshipping him all along. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the way that Daniel says, you know, I really hope it's not, I hope this isn't a, a, a dream about you. Yeah. Although it is, um, you know, we've been talking throughout about sort of the, the situated uh, Judeans in the in the foreign in the foreign court. Is this part of that same sort of motif of, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we are generous to our a patron king, as it were, and loyal, mm -hmm. which is, is very important. Now, this is one that bothered the rabbis later yeah. on. Because they said, why should a good Jew like Daniel be praying for Nebuchadnezzar of all people? Yeah. But you see, in, the, in Daniel, even in the book of Jeremiah, they say it's actually our own fault. It's not the fault of the king, Nebuchadnezzar. And so, you know, it's not, they, there isn't a spark of revolutionary sentiment actually in this. Now, it does remind me a little bit. We have a, a colleague here at jail uh, named uh, James Scott, mm -hmm. who's written a lot about resistance and the ways in which people articulate resistance when they're not in a position to challenge the ruling power openly. He calls this a hidden transcript. Now, Daniel here you see, isn't challenging the right of Nebuchadnezzar to be king. Mm -hmm. He is not saying that Judeans shouldn't uh, serve him. But he's telling a story about him where actually he's just like a wild beast. Yeah. And this way you get your fun. Mm -hmm. You know, you get your satisfaction and you keep things in perspective. Right. The second uh, chapter we're talking about today, uh, chapter five, is maybe, at least uh, in terms of our uh, sort of colloquial idioms, uh, one of the, the other really famous parts of the book of Daniel, uh, this is the famous writing on the wall uh, episode where uh, we have an, a new king, Belshazzar, not a real king. Not a real king, but a real person. And so, you know, this, <laughs> one of the things that confuses people about these chapters in Daniel is that there's just enough <laughs> uh, historical resonance in it to make people always think that maybe it really did happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course this, you know, any good fiction writer will throw in some real people in real places. Yeah. Now, Belshazzar was the crown prince mm -hmm. who was in charge in Babylon when Nabonidus was off in the wilderness, mm -hmm. but he was never actually king. The, the use of uh, Belshazzar, I mean, you're talking about, you know, sort of, representations of people and filling out the story. This yeah. is a great, I mean, a really well done scene. Yes. Right? You were given a full description of this feast and all the people, and you really get a sense of, of what it, of, of, of how, how it would have, how it would have looked. Um, but then uh, in the middle of this, this remarkable meal, uh, a hand appears, right? And starts writing, writing some, what seem like nonsense words uh, on the wall. Uh, and again, and we shouldn't be surprised now, the king wants it to be interpreted. And again, the locals fail. And again, who comes to the rescue but our, our interpretive hero, uh, Daniel. Daniel. Yes. Um, is it simply just another, another version of the same story again? It is. You know, it's, uh, it's a remarkably spooky scene mm -hmm. in this case. You know, the detached hand writing. Now, there's also some history behind this story because the words that are used, mene, tekel, and farsin, were designations of kinds of money right. in, de in declining value. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in that sense, this story would have been very much like the one in chapter two. Right, with the statue of silver, and, gold, And the prediction of mm -hmm. how things are going to go downhill. But the way Daniel interprets it, 
uh, it's not he, that he at says, all. He's not that at all. It says, you're weighed in the scale and found wanting, and your kingdom is given to the Medes and the Persians. So this is obviously a secondary use uh-huh. of, a, of a story like that. But what, where this one differs from all the other stories is the sheer antagonism. And yeah. you see, Belshazzar doesn't really recover. It's that night the, per, the uh, Darius the Mede comes along, Right. And exit, Belshazzar dies. That, exit uh, Belshazzar. Uh, yeah. Uh, this, that sort of very confrontational tone between Daniel and the king, that's, um, that's quite different from what we've, we've been talking about. I mean, and, it, it, and, and would, you, would you think that that has something to do with Belshazzar actually never having been a, a king? I mean, is, is, are we able to play more with that character, to yes. be more confrontational, precisely because no one could actually be offended. He isn't a real king. He's not a legitimate king. You can, you can uh, get mileage out of that. You have cover, right. in other words. Now, what some people, though, nowadays would argue is that this shows what Daniel really thought <laughs> about the Babylonian kingdom and that there is an undercurrent of hostility all the time. I, not, I wouldn't go so far with that. I think if you look at these stories on the whole relations are still pretty good. Mm -hmm. There is still a positive outlook. Uh, The king will come around. Mm -hmm. But there is, you know, this allows for the possibility if he doesn't come around. Yeah. Right. We've, we've set up, we've set it up so that either is okay, really. Um, But also there seems, there's a recognition that, you know, Nebuchadnezzar did rule for a good long time. Darius did have a nice, I mean, you can't, uh, there's, there's historical, you can say they converted, but we can't have them dying before their time, as it were. That's right, true. In these stories. Yeah. Whereas, again, with Belshazzar, we can sort of cut him off whenever, whenever we like to and, uh, and, and play a little bit. You know, you, you, if you're telling a, a story based in the latter years of the That's Babylonian right. kingdom, mm-hmm. everybody knew the ba- that Babylon eventually fell. That's right. And th- you know, that's too good to pass over. Yeah, yeah, there's an opportunity for, for, uh, yes. sending, for sending a nice message and, there. And however loyal Daniel and his friends may appear to the Babylonians, in the end of the day, they are hoping for something else yeah. down the road. I would say, I'd call this deferred eschatology. You know, they're not actually looking for God to suddenly strike down all the Babylonian kings right away, mm-hmm. but eventually. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting, interesting point. That is the, the, the stories that are written from within um, a foreign setting, within an exiled, exiled setting, whether it's Babylonian or whether they're in Persian yeah. or, or wherever it may be. We are used to the notion, I think, maybe from the prof- prophetic books, of a, um, a desire for immediate return. Yeah. And you really don't get that from the books that were... I think, more authentically written in those foreign settings. They seem to be much more realistic about uh, the length of time they might end up spending there. Yes, and I think some of them may also have realized that life wasn't so bad. Mm -hmm. Uh, There were many Judeans in Babylon who didn't rush to come back when they got the opportunity. And in the later period, a lot of people figured life was much better in Alexandria. Yeah. So as, so as we did. as we sort of come to the end of these uh, the first the first half of the book of Daniel um, and these these court tales that we've uh, that we've are really so enjoyable such enjoyable stories what we're really looking at then is a collection of thoughts about life in foreign land and how to maneuver within a, a dominant culture that is very different from your own without losing identity. Is that yes, a big picture? Yes, and how to juggle loyalty to a foreign king and loyalty to your own God, an exclusive loyalty mm-hmm. to your own God. Yeah, it's an, I mean, it's and, an issue that is obviously very long-lasting. I mean, this comes into the New Testament as well. I mean, this is a, a serious, long-lasting rabbinic literature, um, even in some cases very much up to the present, right? How do you balance uh, religious faith loyalty, even in terms of practice, practice and belief, yeah, with being yeah, part yeah. of what we would now call a secular society, but at the, you know, at, yeah. at the very least, a different one? You know, the Book of Esther, which is another case of this, does so without really talking about worship at all. Yeah. 
Daniel is much more religious yeah. in that regard, but it's insisting that you can be religious, you can even go against the edict of the king and still be appreciated for your loyalty. Yeah. It's still supposed to be a formula for how to get ahead in the Gentile world. Right. The second half of the book that we're going to turn to next, completely different. Completely, yeah.